Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Did I go into verse 12 and go into the post-trib rapture last week? No. Does anybody remember? I think we're on starting on verse 12. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Lord, I pray that you'll take and uh, be with the services. I pray that you'll teach us some things out of your word. Help us to understand that the wording of things in your word is very important. That we'll pay attention to it. I pray that you'll take and uh, just wash me now in your precious blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me wisdom as I teach your word. And I give your people understanding of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now this is one of the raptures in the Bible. I debated a number of years ago with a guy about pre-trib rapture versus post-trib rapture. We are pre-trib here meaning we believe the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Uh, That's the doctrinal stand that we take in our statement of faith, meaning that you who are saved right now in the church age will be raptured here, then the seven years of tribulation start. Now where people get confused is when they study the Scriptures, they see what looks to be a rapture, that takes place here. And they try to make this rapture that rapture. And what they do not understand, uh, them guys that I was debating with, they said, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. No, it's not in the Bible. The word rapture means to catch, the catching of one up. So come up hither. Here's a rapture. You are being caught up into heaven. This is a rapture. Or a resurrection. Uh, You have a number of resurrections in the Bible. You also have a number of raptures. Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. Jesus Christ was raptured after he showed himself to the disciples. He ascends up into heaven. That's a rapture. He's caught up into heaven. The church will be raptured. And there's also the great multitude and revelation of every kindred, tongue, and nation is redeemed from this earth. That's a rapture. Then you have this here, which looks to be a rapture. Now when that great multitude is caught up to heaven, it doesn't really say when that happens. There's a scene up in heaven where you have the 144,000. That's in heaven. And then you have a great multitude that was redeemed from the earth, both out of great tribulation who overcame the beast. So you have those two groups mentioned in Revelation, but you cannot pinpoint exactly when they go from the earth to heaven, which means either they're raptured or they're killed and resurrected. One or the other. Because they don't just go from the tribulation into the millennium. There's a scene where they're in heaven around the third throne. So they got there somehow. So the question comes up, when, does the, the, when, when do they ascend? When do they go up? The come up hither here indicates that there's a calling up and you have at least the two prophets. My belief is this is when your post-trib rapture happens. Right here toward the end of the tribulation when these two are called up. I think others go up too. Uh, You have a resurrection of the Old Testament saints when? When Jesus Christ comes up from the dead. Don't you remember in Matthew where it says many of the saints arose and were seen of many? Well, what do you think they did? Get, get up, walk around, shake a few people's hands, and go crawl back into their grave? No, they were resurrected. Yes. They did go into the city. Yeah, they went in the city and seen, was seen of many. So what do you think happened? Was it a zombie apocalypse where they just walked around? 
people saw him and then crawl back into the grave? No, I don't think so. They were resurrected at that point. How many? No. But many of the Old Testament saints were seen in many. So uh, there's more that happens in the Bible than the average person sees. I believe there's seven raptures. I can identify six of them. One of them I'm still a little wishy-washy. I believe there will be seven of them. Uh, there's seven resurrections. Uh, so there's more than one. Here's one of them we're dealing with. I want you to take your Bible. I want you to look at several verses. First, look at Hebrews chapter 9. This may not look like a uh, rapture to you, but you've got to understand, doctrinally, the book of Hebrews are written to Jews in the tribulation looking for the millennial rest. You can look at Hebrews in two different ways. One, the entering in of the New Testament for church age doctrine. Spiritual application, you can almost teach the whole book looking at it that way. And then you look at doctrinally from a Jew that's waiting to go into the millennial rest that's in the tribulation. It fits a little bit better that way. It's written, and that's why it's called the Hebrews. It's a book written to the Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and look at verse 28. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Unto salvation. And so when he appears to them, they see him, they're caught up, and at that time they've overcome because they're caught up. So he appears unto them unto salvation. You can take that verse very literal for somebody in the tribulation. They're looking for him to come back and redeem them from the earth. That's their salvation. Now that's a very literal interpretation of it. Now it's, that's different than what you're going to hear most people teach it as. But I teach that as actually the rapture where they're looking. Now, link it with Matthew chapter 24. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Now, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are tribulation passages. These are not church age passages. Here's where people mess up. Everybody that believes you be, will go through the rapture and, be, and that you can lose your... I mean, every person that believes you'll go through the tribulation and believes you'll be raptured at the end of the tribulation will take you in Matthew 24 and 25. That is where they'll take you. And the reason being is they're looking at something that's in the tribulation. They are correct in their locate on their time period. But they're applying it to the wrong person. Alright, Matthew chapter 24. And look at verse 40. Matthew chapter 24, pick up verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready... For such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Alright, now, look at, now continue read, reading. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that, what? Evil servant... He's still a servant, right? But he's an evil servant. Shall say in his heart, My Lord, his what? His Lord, the lay of his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servant, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware, and shall cut him asunder, and point him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That man goes to hell. 
Weeping and gnashing of teeth is him going to hell. Now you see where they're getting it. The guy loses salvation because he's not looking for the Lord to come. And he starts doing things that he shouldn't. That does not fit church age doctrine at all. But that's what it says. We don't, we're Bible believers here. We are not Bible correctors. And we are not Bible finaglers. We don't finagle it to match our belief. We believe it what it says. So you have to put it in the right context without changing it or trying to twist it around. Now, look at Matthew chapter 25. Pick up verse 1. Here's the parable of the virgins. Then shall be the kingdom of heaven. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins also trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to what? To the marriage, and the door was shut. And off afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know not neither the day nor hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right, so if they went into a marriage, that means they were taken up to where the marriage is at, right? Now, take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Now, the church is presented to Jesus Christ as what? A chaste virgin. She's not virgins. She's a chaste virgin. She's one virgin. She is the bride. But what does every bride have? She has bridesmaids, which are virgins. Virgins without number, it says in Song of Solomon. Now, look at uh, Luke, which means there's more than one group at this wedding. All right, look at Luke and pick up verse 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And to me, this is the key passage right here. Luke 12, pick up verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from what? The wedding. Okay, so you're waiting for somebody that's returning from what? Something that's already happened. He's returning from the wedding. Now wait a second. Wasn't these caught up to the wedding? Now he's returning from the wedding? What's going on here? You see the difference? Return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. In other words, he's going to feed them. He's going to feed them a meal. Now, here's the understanding of the wedding. All right? Jewish wedding. You have, here's what you got going on. You have the church age saint being raptured. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They are called up. They are led out. They follow him out. The sheep follow him out. He doesn't come all the way to the earth. He calls them up hither and leads them out. So they are led out. They go up to the judgment seat of Christ. They're presented to Christ as a chaste virgin. The wedding starts. You have the marriage vow ceremony where they're joined. What follows the marriage vow? Vow ceremony. Supper. Supper. 
Okay. But you also have ten virgins that's going to be at this wedding after the judgment seat of Christ. Well, to be there, or these virgins that had their, was looking for it. So they have to be called up to be part of that ceremony. Because they're part of the ceremony. They're there. They're not called up at the same time. They're called up after. Then he comes back from the wedding and there's some people looking for him. Luke, he comes back and he sets them down at the table and feeds them, beginning of the millennium. Marriage supper of the Lamb starts with the beginning of the millennium. He comes back. Okay, so you have two catchings up of two different people. One catching up will be toward the end, right here. Well, you're at the end right here where it says, come up hither. Come up hither. And you're right there at the end. I put that, I know there's a rapture in the tribulation. That I have no doubt about. The exact timing of it I am guessing is with these resurrection of these two prophets. You say, why do you do that? Well, look at the rapture and the resurrection of the church age. When does it happen? Almost, sim- sim- uh, almost at the same time. The dead in Christ arise first, then we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds. So will we ever be with the Lord. Okay, But the dead in Christ rise first. Well, you have the dead rising. Their heads come back on them and they rise. So what would immediately follow? Rapture. You have almost the exact same thing. Now they almost look like the exact... That would also be the resurrection of all the tribulation saints that's under the altar. They said, how long? Till the rest are killed. So they're waiting for a resurrection. The souls under the altar. Then you have the great multitude redeemed from the earth, and you have the 144,000. They're all taken up into heaven. When does it happen? All right? So what you have is you have two raptures. They look similar. And everybody tries to link them together. When you link them together and make them the same, you have to make in a post-trib rapture, which means you have to go through the tribulation if you make them the same. That disallows pre-trib doctrine. If you're pre-trib, you cannot make them the same. But if you're a Bible believer, you have to say there is a rapture in that tribulation. So what do you do? Well, you divide your Bible and you make it two raptures. Whoa, why did anybody ever think about that? You make two, two raptures. It tells you rightly divide the Word of God. Study it, show yourself, proved unto God, rightly dividing the Word of truth. You know what every problem is with uh, somebody that's a Bible believer, but he cannot divide the Bible? A Bible believer, they believe the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God. But they can't get their doctrine right. Do you know what the problem is? They think everything in the Bible is revolving around them. And that's not the case. Not everything in the Bible revolves doctrinally around precious little you. I I hate to be blunt about it, but... Some of it's written to people in the tribulation. Some of it's written to people in the Old Testament. I, it's written for my learning. Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, Exodus, num, but I don't have to make them badger skin temples and make all them sacrifices and do all them things. Are you doing all that stuff right now? Why? Because it wasn't written to you. It's written for your learning, but not for you to practice it. Because you were not told to do that. You were told to put your faith in Jesus Christ alone without your own works. That's what you were told to do. You're supposed to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, period, and put your faith alone in His righteousness. That's what you were told to do. 
And there's an important verse for your learning in the Old Testament. It says, to obey is better than sacrifice. God's not worried about your sacrifice. He's worried about you obeying, doing what He tells you to do. Now guess what? He tells this guy to do something different. And then He tells this guy to do something different. And He told this guy to do something different. And He told this guy to do something different. You know how Adam was to inherit eternal life? Simple, don't eat of a piece of fruit. Now, is that your gospel? Don't eat of a fruit. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know how to have eternal life? Don't eat of that tree out there, Brother Ott. He'll die and go to hell if he obeys that gospel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know? Brother Ott, go build an ark and get on it. Huh? He'll die and go to hell. The key is to obey what God told you to do. Have faith in what He says and believe Him and obey Him. That's the key. And if you do that, He'll show you His grace and His mercy. We're saved by grace. Every man saved by grace. You say, how's that work? How's every man saved by grace? Because no man deserves salvation. So grace was shown to every man. Some of them had to put forth some effort and judge according to their effort. But every man saved by grace. Every man saved by obedience. Doing what God told them to do. Now do you see that? Do you see that? Do you see how that works? Here's a guy. Grace and obedience. Without faith. Saying, how is there without faith? Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne right there where they can see Him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is why here, prophecy is speaking of something you can't see. If a man prophesies here, he is to be put to death because there is no prophecy in the millennium. Prophecy has been fulfilled. So what does a man have to do? He's still a sinner in the millennium. Sin is not taken away till after the end of the millennium. He's still a sinner, so what does he have to do? Completely obey what the dictator on the throne says. They have to obey Jesus Christ. You know there's passages in the Bible dealing with the millennium, telling man what to do in the millennium. If your hand offend thee, cut it off. If your eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your, hand, if your foot offend thee, cut it off. Brother, Martinez, to get to heaven, if uh, your hand wants to steal something, go cut it off. You think that's going to get him to heaven? No. Why? Because he's misapplying a verse of Scripture and trying to apply it to him that doesn't belong there. Now, you can learn from it. You can learn from it. You know what? What do you learn from that? What God thinks about sin. You learn from it. There's, you can learn from every part of Scripture. Every part of Scripture, to a degree, you can apply it to your life. But when it comes to literally applying it doctrinally to you, you better be careful. You better be careful. Yes, sir. Question. Right. That is your pre trib rapture. Huh? No. Somewhat, to somewhat of a degree, yes. Right. The church, is, the church hears that shout. Uh, the world will hear a noise. Just like the ones, the example of that is Saul. When Paul saved, they that are with him hear a noise, but they didn't hear the voice. So something happens, they know something happened, but they don't hear it clearly. Well, what you're going to hear is you're going to hear your name called.
called and you called up, you'll hear the voice calling you. They know, uh, look at John. Uh, I want John, where's the sheepfold? I think it's John chapter 10. Yeah, John chapter 10. Look at verse 4. Oh, well, let's get uh, verse 3. Well, let's go up, get verse 1, get the context. John chapter 10 and verse uh, 1. So this will go along with your First Thessalonians chapter 4 there, brother. Look at uh, chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and what? The sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep, what? By name, and does what? And leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. This parable spake Jesus unto them, that they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't understand it because they didn't have the following verses, but we know that that's the Lord coming back and calling you and leading you out. In other words, he doesn't come back to the earth. He calls you and leads you out. That's the rapture of the church. That's what you're reading in 1 Thessalonians. The other part is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You want to read 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's the rapture of the church. Huh? That's the day of the Lord. That's a different... That is referring... you got the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. The day of Christ is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ, which is going on at the same time as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord can refer to everything from the tribulation to the end of the millennium. It will be referred to as in that day through the Old Testament. In that day, in that day. But that is a long section of time. Okay, it's not a literal day, it's a time period. It's like a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Because it can refer to events in the tribulation. Most of the time, it will refer to the second coming. Literal second coming. And it can refer to the millennial throne. Reign. You'll see all them things in that day. The day of the Lord. For the judgment seat of Christ, that's the day of Christ. What you have in First, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, they're being told that's already happened. And Paul's saying, don't be worried about this. It hasn't all happened because this, these things have to come place first. We know it hasn't happened. So, uh, like here are some people saying the rapture's happened, you're in the tribulation right now. There's a guy that just recently said that. His name was, uh, what was that guy that had that family radio? He says, well, we were spiritually raptured. No, you weren't. You, you false predicted it and you were wrong. Come on. <laughs> I meant it. <laughs> I mean, and uh, he thinks you went into the tribulation. Well, that's what Paul's warning about. Don't be shaken in mind if somebody says the rapture's already happened. It hasn't happened yet. What they'll do to do that, they have to spiritualize everything in the tribulation. You know you're not in the tribulation if you actually believe what it says about the tribulation. You're not in the tribulation right now. I mean, things are bad. That's because there's always been sin in the world. They will be bad. There will always be wicked people like Hitler. <laughs> I mean, but you're not in the tribulation. You're not there yet. You won't be there either. Because that's not pointed to you. It's not pointed to you. You'll be raptured before that. All right, that's the pre trib doctrine. Uh, we take the stand, one of our parts of our statement of faith. Now, on these things about the tribulation that I teach, I'm teaching that for your understanding. 
So somebody won't dupe you in Revelation, try to put something on you they shouldn't. But doctrinally, you know what? Somebody can join the church that disagrees with me in just about everything I'm teaching here. This is strong meat, strong doctrine. I'm not going to make an issue with that if somebody doesn't believe in a tribulation rapture. Personally, I don't care if you believe it or not. I'm teaching it because I'm accountable to what I teach. I teach every word. But the pre-trib rapture? We make that part of our statement of faith because that will keep you from a lot of false doctrine. And the false doctrine we're trying to keep you from is you losing your salvation in the tribulation. Because if you believe that you go into the tribulation, the next thing that comes is you reject eternal security. That's the next thing to come. Happens every time. Once a man quits believing in a pre-trib rapture, he starts thinking he can lose his salvation. And that's what you want to avoid. So there's a, there's a few things I have. I have ten things in my statement of faith that I require somebody to believe before they become a voting member of the church. And those ten things, one of them is a pre-trib rapture. Amen. You have to believe in a pre-trib rapture. And the reason I do that is if somebody doesn't believe in a pre-trib rapture, I know they don't have salvation right. They're going to think that they can lose their salvation. It's, it, yeah, I've never seen it where they don't. Or they don't believe the Bible the correct way. One or the other. Alright, take your Bible and turn back to Revelation chapter 11. So, uh, you also want to, uh, for the wedding feast is after the wedding, you want to write down Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Here's cross references. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And Esther, chapter 2, verses 17 and 19. 17 through 19. So you want to go home and study them two passages along with that. And it'll show you some. Uh, more light on it. Now, whether or not you can fully understand exactly when that tribulation rapture happens and all the details about it, well, then you're doing better than I can. There's still things about it that really make me scratch my head. As I go on, I see it more and more clearly, but there's still things about it that just I just have to say I still don't understand everything about it. Okay. Esther chapter 2 verses 17 through 19. And that's basically going to show you that the supper is after the wedding ceremony. And that will show you that that's the way the Jewish uh, marriages worked. Revelation chapter 11 verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. So that earthquake's going to come after these two are raptured. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, you're dealing with what is the third woe? You have two woes that's passed. And it doesn't mention what the third woe is. But what you have following next is verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. And there was a great voice in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and shall reign forever and ever. Well, that's the millennial reign. So what do you have in between? How many of you know? What do you have in be before the millennium starts? What do you have? No, that's after the millennium. In between the millennium and what we just looked at, this rapture of the poster, you have the second coming. Armageddon. That's your third woe. Your third woe is actual, the actual second coming of Christ. Where He comes and He lands on earth and you have blood running up to a horse's bridle. That is your third woe. And uh, so you have your first woe, you have your second. First woe is all the stuff that happens, the plagues. Second woe is the devil incarnate. 
And then the third woe is the second coming. Now, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. Now, you will be taught by some that the seventh angel, angel sounding is the last trump that you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If somebody's trying to push on you and make it a post-trib rapture, they'll take this verse and match it to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and say that last trump is the seventh trumpet of Revelation. That's not the case. There's a difference between a trump and a trumpet. Joe, what's a trump? It's the sound that the trumpet makes, right? Oh, come on. You play the trumpet, buddy. <laughs> You're supposed to know this. <laughs> it's the last sound that the trumpet makes. So at the rapture, you're raptured at the last trump, at the last sound. It's like when the bugle goes to wake you up. Right when that thing ends, you go up. Last trumpet is just the seven angels sounding the seven trumpets. Okay? It's two different things. Uh, they're trying to link two verses together that don't belong. Uh, but that's the two that they'll try to link together. Uh, the problem with that is, and the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord. This is how you know that that isn't the rapture of the church, because that would do, mean this. You're going to do this. Boing, boing. <laughs> I mean, you're being led up at the rapture. You're being taken out. Yet here, the Lord's starting to reign on the earth. Well, you just don't go up and come down. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. It's two different, it's talking about two different things. You have the battle of Armageddon in between there. Verse 16, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Now where are you? You're at the end of the millennium. Well, there's a thousand years in between verse 15 and verse 17. That's where people get confused with the Scripture when they don't study the Bible as a whole. You see what I'm saying? You just jumped a thousand years. We know that the millennium is 1,000 years in Revelation chapter, I think it's 20, beginning of Revelation chapter 20. It says like five times, 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. Seven. seven times. It says it seven times. So it's 1,000 years. Well, you just covered 1,000 years in two verses. Sometimes prophecies in the Old Testament, you got the first coming of Christ and you got the second coming of Christ in the exact same verse. So you can jump real fast with that. So you got to be careful with that stuff. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to interpret a verse without knowing what the rest of the Bible says. Everything in the Bible does this number and makes a whole. And when you got something out of line, guess what? Where it ain't fitting, you want to know why? because something's wrong with your thinking. We say, oh, there must be something wrong with the Scripture. Let's change it so they'll match. That's the wrong move to make. You have to stop and sit there and say, I don't understand something. Lord, I'm going to leave it alone till I get it. When I get it, then it's going to do this. number, And it'll be a perfect match. You know why people don't do that? Because they're proud and they're smarter than God. So they're going to make that Bible match their thinking because the almighty, their almighty brain was smarter than God's Word. That's where people mess up. You can't go there. You can't go there. All right, let's take a break there. We'll continue next week with the next verse.